So good morning. So today we're going to be looking at Matthew 22, verse 39. So if you have a Bible with you, I want you to open up to that. Even if you know it, open up to there. I want your eyes and your hands on the text. If you're using one of the Pew Bibles, it's page 692. And if you don't have a Bible at home, take one of those Pew Bibles home with you. That's our gift to you. So kids, I want you to look at the worship folder and then flip it over, look on the back. You'll notice that there's fill in the blanks. So pay attention to me. Fill in those blanks as I go through my sermon. And then afterwards, go show Mr. Lee back there. Lee, could you raise your hand? The guy right back there, show him a filled out, fill in the blank, and he has a prize for you. So being loving, it's a defining mark of the Christian. Jesus tells us that we should be so loving that when people from the outside look in, they're like, that guy, that girl is a follower of Jesus. The Bible tells us that if you don't love your fellow Christian, you're a liar and you actually don't love God. S things like that should get us to take a step back and ask ourselves, do we truly love God? Because it's when we answer that question it gives us insight into our standing with Christ. And the verse that we're going to look at today, the verse Jesus gives us, it's like a magnifying glass that we could hold our life up to, and we are either going to see the miraculous work of God or something far, far less. And the love that Jesus calls us to it's not just going to be your everyday run-of-the-mill love, right? Because, I mean, we see examples of different types of love all around us. And I have four girls, so these are all going to be like Disney or Pixar examples. But So just bear with me. But, like, we have the princess who sweeps in and saves the prince. Or, more and more common, the princess who sweeps in and saves the prince, or the prince that saves the princess. We have Moana. She loves her family and village so much that she'll go on this perilous journey across the ocean to return the heart of Tafiti and save them. In the Incredibles, we see that the love of family overcomes any obstacle. Even Daniel Tiger tells us that making something is one way to say, adults who have seen that, can you help me out here? I love you. Every adult who's watched that show with their kid just sing the song in their mind. Our parents and our teachers tell us to love others as you would want to be loved. What we're going to see today is that the love Jesus calls us to isn't less than those things, because those are all really good things. But what we're going to see is that the love Jesus calls us to is something so much more. We're going to see today that the love Jesus calls us to is the greatest type of love we could ever show. And while we're going to look specifically at Matthew 22, verse 39, I actually want to read verses 34 through 40 just to give us a little context. So verses 34 through 40, they read, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, so this is Jesus talking now. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. This is God's word for us this morning, church. Let's pray. Father, uh, <clears throat> we ask that the Holy Spirit oppress upon our minds and our hearts this morning the importance <clears throat> of what Jesus says here. Help us to see how this type of love not just shows us what to do, but how this actually shows us who you are. Empower us, Lord, to show a love to others that points people to you 
and enable us, Lord, to live lives that are inspired by the gospel. So many of us know this verse, but we ask that the Holy Spirit will make it fresh to us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the amazing love that you've shown us through sending your Son to die for our sins, and that through faith in him, we have eternal, abundant life. In Jesus' name, we ask all these things. Amen. So in the beginning of Matthew 22, verse 39, Jesus says, A second is like it. So Jesus just got done saying that the great command that underwrites all of the law is to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then he says, the second commandment I'm going to tell you is just like the first. And in that, we see that the love that we show others is directly linked to the, our love of God. And you may be wondering, like, why do I have to love God to love others? We have to love God in order to be able to love others because the type of love that Jesus is talking about here is a God-empowered love. And that actually brings us to our first point. The type of love that Jesus calls us to is the greatest type of love because it's a God-empowered love. So kids, if you're filling in the blanks, Jesus calls us to a God-empowered love. And we see this even more clearly as we keep reading. The word that Jesus uses here for love is usually the word used to describe God's love for us. This type of love, it's a choice. It's not a feeling. It's self-sacrificial. It's willful and active. This type of love is a type of love that seeks out the greatest good for the person being loved. This type of love is amazing. But it's also impossible for us to show it in our own power. It's impossible to show this type of love in our own strength because of this thing called sin nature. When Adam and Eve sinned, they brought sin into the world. They didn't just bring punishment on themselves. They just didn't bring curse on all creation. But this thing called sin nature became part of humanity became part of what it meant to be human. And this sin nature, this thing that's part of us now, it affects, it touches every single thing that we do. And because of that, none of us, without the power of God, can show this type of love that Jesus is talking about. No matter how hard we try, no matter how nice we are, we're going to fall short because our sin nature gets in the way. The greatest illustration of the effects of sin I actually got from this book I've read to the girls. And it describes it this way. So imagine you're playing outside. It's a 100 degree day. And you've been playing outside for like hours. And you are dying of thirst. And all you can think about is a drink of water. And you head home. And as soon as you come up to the door, your mom comes out with this big glass of ice water. Oh, so good. And as you reach for it, a bird flies overhead and poops in the glass of water. I know! You're like, no! Who of you would drink that water? We're going to be honest here. This is a safe place. Raise your hand if you would drink the bird poop water. I don't think so. What if, what if though, how about this? What if I stir it up so it dissolves? No. A little bit of bird poop tainted. It ruined that whole glass of water. <laughs> and in the same way, when we're doing something outside, outside of God's power, no matter how great it looks, just like the glass of bird poop, our sin ruins it. The good news is, and this is good news, that Jesus knows this. He doesn't expect us to do this on our own. That's why the love we show others is linked to our love for God. Because when we place our faith in Jesus, and in doing so love God with all our heart, and all our soul, and all our mind, 
we're transformed. Our sins are forgiven in Christ. We receive Jesus' goodness and rightness. We're brought into relationship with him. We're filled with the Spirit. And this, listen, pay attention to this. This is important. The effect of sin in our life, that rule and control our sinful nature had over us, is broken. And while in this life we'll never be perfect, we'll always be fighting that sin. When we place our trust in Jesus, God breaks that rule sin has for us and brings us under his rule. In this, and this is important, God is completely undoing what Adam and Eve started in the Garden of Eden. He's undoing what that sin had created and redeeming us and restoring us to what we were created to be. And as all that is happening in the life of the believer, the Christian is empowered by God to show true love. That's why our love for God is directly linked to our love for others. And we see this in the Bible. John wrote in 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. Everything else, no matter how hard we try, no matter how good it looks, everything else apart from God is just a glass of water with poop in it. So as we keep reading in verse 39, we see you shall love who? Who shall we love? No? Read verse 39. You should love your neighbor. <laughs> yes. So good question to ask is who's our neighbor? And someone asked Jesus that in the Gospel of Luke 10, verse 29 through 37. We're not going to read that, but Jesus basically said, your neighbor is anyone that you can show love to. This means that every single day, we have an opportunity to show this type of Jesus love to others. And this type of love is gospel-inspired. And so that brings us to our second point. Kids, the type of love that Jesus calls us to is the greatest type of love ever. One, because it's empowered by God. But two, because it's a gospel-inspired love. So fill in a blank number two. Every day we can show a gospel-inspired love. So in order to see what that even means or how this all relates to each other, we have to ask, what's the gospel? One of the books that I looked at defined it this way. The gospel, the good news, is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, all of which accomplishes redemption and restoration for all who believe in him. It's in the gospel that we see most clearly the love of God. For us, God's love's unmerited. It's undeserved and unearned. God's love was freely given to us as we are saved by grace through faith in Christ. So when you place your faith in Jesus, when you're filled with the Spirit, and you're loving those around you, you're in a very real way reflecting the love of God. That's why in Ephesians 5, 1 through 2, the Bible says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The love seen in the gospel is the same love that we give glimpses of when we love others each and every day. So as we love our neighbor, we will daily be able to show a God-empowered, gospel-inspired love. Then, looking back at verse 39 now, we see that the verse says to love your neighbor as yourself. So how do you love yourself? You feed yourself. You take care of yourself. You do things to bring joy and happiness in your life. And so another way to say this is that we love ourselves with a life-giving love. And that's, for, that's actually point number three. The type of love Jesus calls us to is the greatest type of love we could ever show. 
because it's God empowered, because it's gospel inspired. And the last one is because it has a life giving impact. So the love Jesus calls us to has a life giving impact. When I love my daughters and I give them a big hug and I'm flipping them on my shoulders and holding them upside down by their ankles like I'm trying to steal their lunch money, they love it. They laugh and they giggle and they're energized by it. And if I jokingly like pretend like I don't want to hug from you, they will like mob tackle me. I mean, nothing like a grown man getting taken down by a bunch of little girls, but it happens. But I know that when I do that, the love isn't just a dad interacting with his daughter. I know because of my faith in Christ that in that love I'm showing him, it's life-giving. And that's something that they are going to take with them for the rest of their lives. When you love with a Jesus-empowered, gospel-inspired type of love, God doesn't use it just to enrich the lives of those around us. But he uses it to actually show others the love he has for them. So many times, God uses Christians as his means of grace to impact the lives of those around him. And many times we think this love has to be some grandiose action, right? Like, I'm not loving my wife unless I take her to to the Bahamas. But that's such a lie. (laughs) Sorry, wives. That's just, that's not true. Hey, you'll like what I have to say next, though. (laughs) One example, say the Christian husband. He's growing in his faith. And he starts to see his wife as an incredible blessing. A blessing far greater than he deserves, for sure. Amen, right? And so what does he decide to do? No, not take his wife to the Bahamas. He says, I'm going to do the dishes without being asked. That's right. Can you get an amen to that, too? And the whole time, he's praying that God uses that to encourage her. That's life-giving love. And it's funny because that's incredibly unremarkable. But because it's empowered by God, because it's inspired by the gospel, it's life-giving. And this is important. So adults and kids, pay attention here. If you get anything from what I say today, right now. This type of love that Jesus calls us to doesn't necessarily look different. It's not necessarily in the action or in what's done. The difference in this type of love is Jesus. That's what makes all the difference. So to wrap things up, there are three categories and all of us fit into one of these categories and there's immediate steps that we could take so the first group are those of you who haven't placed your faith in Jesus you may want to love others you may try to love others and do great things but without a faith in Christ you're going to fall short and know what if you're honest with yourselves you're going to feel that you're going to feel no matter what you do that it's not good enough that what you do isn't what you really are desiring to accomplish. Or you could be just the person who hasn't placed their faith in Jesus and you just don't care. You don't care about the Bible. You don't care what Jesus says. If that's you, don't think God brought you here by accident. If that's you this morning, to love yourselves enough to look at your own heart be willing to be honest with yourselves see the weakness and sin in your own heart and then love yourself enough to turn to Christ to see that he and I'm pointing there he died on your sins he died for your sins on the cross and ask God to give you the faith that you could trust your life to him, that you can confess your sins, repent of your sins, turn to Jesus. And in that relationship, in that grace-filled, redeemed relationship with God, then walk in love, then show love. Whether you're natural,
naturally a nice person or you're naturally a mean person, it doesn't matter. Because the reality is our sin separates us God, from God and our sin is going to send us to hell. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross for us. And I'm not saying this to be mean. I'm not saying this to pick on you. But I'm saying this because you trying harder to be nice isn't going to fix anything. You have to trust your life to Jesus before you have that foundation to then love others. The second group are those of us here who have placed our faith in Jesus. But for whatever reason, our love for Jesus and our love for others has grown cold. And honestly, this can be a struggle for me. And this could be a struggle for a lot of us who have been in the church for a long time. And all, this is pretty easy to identify. All you have to do is ask, what was my attitude towards others as I drove into church today? Was I just thinking about myself? Or was I thinking about how annoying someone is or whatever? If that's you... Be willing to admit that. And this is important, and I'm stalling here for a reason. I don't want you to ignore me here. If you look at your life as a follower of Jesus, and you don't see a God-empowered, gospel-inspired, life-giving love, if you don't have a desire to love others, we need to deal with that. We have to. And it's pretty easy first thing you do is confess. So you go to God and you say, I've grown cold in my love for you and love for others. I've neglected what you've called me to do. I've become apathetic in what it means to be a follower. But then you repent. And that's turning to Jesus. Knowing that in Christ you have forgiveness and love. And then ask for God to give you a heart that wants to love others. Don't wait for you to feel all warm and fuzzy. Because honestly, for some of us, that warm, fuzzy feeling is just never going to come. But once you've confessed, once you've repented, once you've asked God for the ability to love others, then act. Act. And it doesn't have to be big. Serve others. Be kind. Encourage someone. And the whole time, pray that God uses that to point those people to Him. And the third group are those of us who have placed our faith in Christ. We try to live this way. We try to love others. But we can always grow in this area. For us, let's remind ourselves the gospel. And I've said this before, but let's preach the gospel to ourselves. And that's such a simple thing, right? You remind yourself what Jesus has done for you, what he is doing for you, and what he will do. You thank God every morning. Don't be afraid to thank God for dying for your sins and giving you life. It's something that simple that keeps our heart warm. You know, a lot of times we think we kind of move by. We're more mature, so we move past the gospel. The gospel is a foundation and a starting point for everything. So daily remind yourselves of what Jesus has done. Pray that God gives you the eyes to see the people around you the way he sees them. That we see people not as inconveniences, not as things that which we could accomplish through, but as people loved by God of incredible value and worth. And then once again, act. And I'd recommend, and this is like free marriage advice here, start with the people who are closest to you. So if you're married, start with your wife, or start with your spouse. Because honestly, it's the people we're closest to who we tend to hurt the most and not notice. So out of our love for others, or out of our love for God, we're going to love others. And this is the greatest love that we could show because it's God-empowered, gospel-inspired, and life-giving. When we love this way, we're going to see people around us flourish. They're not just going to exist next to us, but they will thrive and will draw closer to God. 
we'll look around us and we're going to see people not as in our lives by accident, but we're going to see them as divine appointments set by God in which we're his instruments of grace, mercy, and love. I pray that that's the defining mark of who we are as a church and as people. So let's pray. Father, we love you. Do not let us leave today without looking at our hearts and our lives and comparing it to your word and taking appropriate action, Lord. Light a fire within us, Father, that where we can just show your love, your God-empowered, gospel-inspired, life-giving love to those around us each and every day. And let that be a testimony not to who we are or what we do. Let it be a testimony to the God that you are and how awesome and incredible you are. We thank you, Lord, that you love us so much to pay for our sins, to extend us forgiveness and show us grace and mercy. Let us live out those realities each and every day. In Jesus' name we ask all these things.